So I want you to imagine yourself in your grave and the angels, they approach you. They ask you the three all important questions to see if you pass the test of life. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who is your prophet? Imagine you're in that state right now. Will you be able to answer those questions? You need to live by these answers so you can answer them in your grave. But a person can't live by something that he or she does not know. So you have to learn these things. For that reason, we have a Islamic studies program and we'd like to invite you to take a look at the program by joining our Telegram group at the link below. And if you like it, inshallah ta'ala, and you think this is something that could be suitable for you and you may be able to learn that your deen here, then you can register for the first year of our program. And hopefully, we see you on the other side. Salam alaikum. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salam ala al-Nabi al-Mustafa al-Mushtaba. Before I start today's class, who remembers the homework that I gave you all last week? So the brother said, I asked you all about the hadith, innama bu'ithtu li'utammima makarim al-akhlaq wa salih al-akhlaq. I was only sent to establish the lofty mannerisms. Like, what did I say about the hadith? What was the homework? Okay. It seems from the apparent this hadith, because Adatul Hasal was used, Innama, I was only sent to establish lofty mannerisms and character. And it's contradicting with the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal when He said, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَيَجْتَنِبُ الطَّابُوتِ Indeed, we sent to every nation a messenger to call them to what? Tawheed. That they worship Allah Azza wa Jal and that they refrain from the Tawut, His deities that are worshipped besides Allah Azza wa Jal. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I heard an individual say, and this is on the streets of New York, right? He was trying to make a point that the kuffar are trying to take a reaction out of us, or they're trying to get a reaction out of us, right? Because they started praying on the road. And then he says something like, Messenger was sent to all of mankind, right? Was he sent to teach you the Qur'an? He says, no. Was he sent to teach you about Allah? No. But he was sent to establish lofty mannerisms. Oh, come on, something along the lines of that. Mannerisms or character, I don't know exactly what word that he used. I can see where he's coming from, which hadith he came across, like the hadith that was quoted by brother today. I was only sent to establish what? Lofty mannerisms and characteristics and traits. What do you guys think? That was your homework. How do we now reconcile between what I mentioned? Allah Azza wa Jal saying, We indeed sent to every nation a messenger. And He calls them to Allah. And He calls them to Allah. And to stay away from the Tawut. But then this hadith is speaking about akhlaq. And we should focus more on what? Perfecting our character. Right? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, indeed your character, is, your character is lofty. And your mannerisms are excellent. Hmm. Jameel, good brothers and sisters. The akhlaq is of two types. This is why the first line of poetry that we're going to be taking today is <coughs> after we finish with the introduction. First thing that you should focus on is your adab with Allah. Your etiquette with Allah Azza wa Jalla. How do you have good manners with Allah Azza wa Jalla? 
to leave off sinning and to do what he told you to do. To fulfill the obligations that he has instructed you to come with. وَلِذَلِكُ وَاللَّهِ أَنَا اسْتَغْرَبْتُ Right? He's saying this in a populated, what do they call it? Times Square in New York? Is that what they call it? And he's saying he was only sent for this and he's saying he wasn't even sent to teach you all about Allah Azza wa Jal. SubhanAllah. And this is what happens my brothers and my sisters, right? Before you step into the da'wah scene, I know at times you start practicing, you become extremely zealous and passionate about wanting to guide everyone, right? However, how do you guide someone if you don't have knowledge? What are you going to call them to? And you'll end up falling into some of these very huge blunders, right? It's very, very important, brothers and sisters. It shouldn't be that you run to Hyde Park the moment you start practicing or watching some of these debates that you see in Hyde Park. The way I put it is, whoever shouts the loudest wins, that's Hyde Park for you in a nutshell. Do you guys agree with that? Whoever shouts the loudest wins. And it even amazes me, right, that one feels comfortable to watch these videos and he is not firmly grounded. When shubuhat, doubts are being thrown left, right and center. Do you guys agree with that? These doubts are being thrown around. He's a Christian, atheist, Jew, and the one who's maybe debating with him might not necessarily be able to respond back accordingly. Are you brothers and sisters with me? So one wants to seek knowledge in the first place that he goes to either Hyde Park in person or he's watching these videos. Fear for your hearts, brothers. Right? Fear for your hearts. Imam Dhahbi rahmatullahi alayhi says the scholars have unanimously agreed. Right? That whoever hears a bid'ah or, or some doubt, he shouldn't relate this to the people around him. If he doesn't know how to respond back to it, don't you think his heart might become overpowered by this doubt? This doubt pierces through your heart and it may never ever heal again. And that's how dangerous the doubt is. Right? May Allah Azza wa grant us all beneficial knowledge. For those who want the translation, you can find it in the Telegram group. Okay, you can see you after insha'Allah ta'ala. So now we are online. Number three. Last week we only managed to go through two. Sheikh, he says, وَبَعْدُهَا كَأَحْسَنُ الْأَخْلَاقِ يَنْقَى بِهَا صَاحِبُهَا الْمَرَاقِ He says, to proceed. Now he moves on. Wabad means to proceed. When you're moving on to a different topic. That's why you always hear on the minbar. When the khatib is given the khutbah, he says, Amma ba'd. Now he's moving on to a different topic. Okay. He says, Wabadu. Haka ahsanu al-akhlaqi. Here are the best of etiquettes. Yarqa biha sahibu al-maraqi. Okay. You will indeed elevate into very high positions because of lofty mannerisms and etiquettes. And you can clearly see here that the Shaykh is alluding to a particular hadith, and that is the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu saying, Inna al abda la yudriku bi husni khuluqihi darajat al saimi al qaim. Because of your wonderful etiquettes and character, one will reach the same level as the one who prays in the night and fasts in the day. Brothers, let's be honest, and sisters. Is it easy to wake up in the night for the night prayer? To wake up an hour before Al Fajr and then to start praying? Let's be honest. Is it easy? Difficult? It's pretty difficult, right? <coughs> Put Qiyam al-Layth aside, waking up for Fajr. 
is a huge deal, especially when it becomes very, very early. So, may Allah Azza wa Jal make it easy for us all. And the fast in the day. Huh? Is it easy? Especially on them hot summer days. Right? Very hard. It exhausts you. It takes a lot out of you physically. Sahwa Allah. Do you guys agree with that, brothers and sisters? With etiquette, you can reach that level of someone who prays in the night, fast in the day. Is that clear? And the reality of the matter is, it isn't necessarily that difficult to be good to the people. Do you guys agree with that? Right? If you now look at your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, refraining from sins and doing what you've been told to do. Right? There's only a handful of things, brothers and sisters, that you are commanded to carry out. Throughout your day, you think about it now. Things that are wajib, that are obligatory from the moment I wake up, all the way up until I go to sleep. Are you being told to carry out Hajj every single day? Are you being commanded to pay zakat every day? I'm talking about wujub here, and that which is an obligation. No. Are you being commanded to fast every day of the week? Or you're only commanded now to fast 30 days in a month? Uh, 30 days in the year, which is the month of Ramadan. Sahu ala Five daily prayers. That might take 25 minutes out of 24 hours. Have you been instructed with that? Yes, you have. Brothers and sisters, is that really hard? 25 minutes, wallahi. If you approach a drug dealer, right? who's moving class A drugs from A to B and you say to him 25 minutes of your day okay Wallah is going to look at you with guilt and he'll feel bad and I've approached many in the past he'll feel bad 25 minutes and I have 24 hours in the day he'll feel bad it's easily doable and then to stay away from sins Stay away from it. To hold back from it. You should put your mind to it. You make a lot of dua. Become a couple of, uh, it will become extremely easy. And then the shaykh goes on to say, فَأَوَّلًا رَاعِ مَعَ اللَّهِ الْأَدَبِ بترك الاثم وبفعل ما وجب وحسن ظن وتوكل رجاء حب وتوحيد ومن خاف نجا وحسن ظن وتوكل رجاء حب وتوحيد ومن خاف نجا الشيخ ذا غوزن تسي فأولا فاس من ايش استطاعت with is you etiquette with Allah سبحانه وتعالى Ra'i ma'allahi al-adab You should have good etiquette with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala How do you have good etiquette with Allah azza wa jal? Bitarq al-ithmi wa bifi'ali ma wajab To stay away from sins and to do that which Allah azza wa jal commanded you to do Is that clear brothers and sisters? Ask yourself this question and you tell me whether this is bad manners or not Right? Your mom is calling out and she's saying Ya Abdullah, come here I need you Go to Saints Rays and buy me some milk. And you say, Mom, wait, I'm chilling with my friends. Good etiquette with your mom? What do you guys think? Honestly, your mom who carried you for nine months and then breastfed you. She went through all of that trouble. You know when you will really, really realize? Right? When you have a wife and she becomes pregnant. When that pregnant woman drives you crazy, huh? Oh, some of you guys look confused, but the married guys are looking at me, yeah. They say the first three months, right, of a pregnancy is when she will drive you into the ground. It's the hardest part of her pregnancy, the first three months. And then you take a three month break and then it's back on again. 
pulling your hair out. It's like, hey, brothers and sisters, only then you realize. So I know there was this narration that I came across of Abdullah ibn Abbas in radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Or was it Abdullah ibn Umar? I believe it was Abdullah ibn Umar. I saw a man who was going around the Kaaba. As he was circumambulating around the Kaaba, he was carrying his mother on his shoulders. He was carrying his mother on his shoulders. And after that, he came to his noble companion and he said, Have I paid back my mother? Have I fulfilled her rights now? Khalas? Because of course the mother has a lot of rights on you. Have I now fulfilled the rights of my obligation? You know what he said? Wala talqa. Not even one contraction. You guys know what contractions means? I don't think a lot of you guys are going to know. I remember when I looked at it, I was like, what does that mean? I tried to look it up in Arabic. See, many years ago, I was like, how do I translate this? How do I say in English? And then when the wife gets pregnant, after the water breaks, the whole day, you know how she's going to spend it? She will go through unbearable pains and then it will stop for a little bit. And then it starts again, all the way up until she gives birth. That could be one day, that could be two days, that could be three days. And at times they can't even sleep for a single moment because of these continuous pains. <clears throat> Maybe within one hour she may have 40 to 45 contractions. And between each one she has a couple of moments or sometimes minutes breaks in between. That's one contraction. To Ibn Umar he said, وَلَا طَلْقَةً Not even one. That's really, really profound, brothers, sisters. Anyways, going back to the point that I was making. You say to your mother, just wait there, let me finish whatever I'm doing with my friends. And he's standing in front of the house, chit-chatting with him. Joking around with him, playing around with him. Or you're on what? PS5. The latest one is the PS6 now. Is there one after PS5? He's playing game. Mom, yes! That's bad manners, brothers and sisters. To say yes! Right? And you're continuing playing. What should you be doing? You should be running back to your mom. And saying, okay, mom, what is it that you need? She only called your name because she needs you to come. Yes, what? Sah wa la What? Guess who just called me? My mom. Okay, mama, inshallah, abshir. Yeah. Hada, I tell you, mama, we were speaking about how to treat your mother, and then you called. We were speaking about how to treat the mother, and then Adna Sawati. Okay, don't worry, Mama. in the dars about etiquettes and adab and how to treat your mother, right? And then at sawati, you called. Yeah, she goes, I have a very long life, so may Allah give me a long life. Amri there, they call it, huh? I think, huh? Hey, inshallah, hey, sir. Hey, hey, hey. And the mom comes before the dress, right? Exactly what he was talking about. SubhanAllah. What were we saying, brothers? Huh? When your mother's calling you and you start saying what? What? No, she wants you for something. طيب. We all agree now that this is what? Bad manners, huh? 
It's a bad etiquette. <coughs> Is there anybody here who doesn't believe in Allah Azza wa Jal? Hmm. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran time and time again, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing? The people who have faith. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he would say, whenever you find Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, fa'ar'iha sam'ak, make sure you lend it your ear, because you're about to hear something extremely important. Are you guys with me, brothers and sisters? Is it right now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling you to do something? And then you say that, uh, Allah, you know, you just wait there. Let me do whatever I'm doing and I'll come back to you. Next time you sin, brothers and sisters, think about it like that. Next time you sin, think about it like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you to leave off that woman that is not halal for you or to having this inappropriate conversation with whoever it might be hmm? or this movie that you're watching which again is inappropriate or this person that you're hanging around with when in essence you should be far away from this kind of individual He's speaking to you. When Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, you should take that personally. I'm being addressed. But then, when you decide to continue engaging in the filth and the evil, in essence, brothers and sisters, what you're saying is, you, O Allah, stand there, wait, right? Let me finish my filth and my evil and I'll come back to you. Look at it like that. The other day, when I was at Greenlee Masjid, I had a lecture on Saturday after Maghrib. The lecture was at the same time as a very huge event taking place in Paris. What was that? Champions League final. I, Wallahi, did not think that anybody would attend. I genuinely didn't think anybody would attend because I know how the people love football so much, especially when it's the Champions League final. You have the wife who barely has any interest to football, she'll come and watch the penalty shootout. So, do you guys agree with that? So I thought, oh, you know what? I don't think anybody's going to come, but I was really blown away with how many people attended. Right? One of the things that I discussed was, at the beginning of the lecture, this is before we even got into the topic that I was asked to speak about. When the Imam says Allahu Akbar, what does Allahu Akbar mean? <coughs> hmm. so and but what does Allahu Akbar actually mean? What does it translate to? <coughs> Everybody knows that, right? Allah is the greatest. If someone said with their tongue that Allah is not, going, Allah is not the greatest, you'll see tables being flipped, right? People get upset. How can you say that about Allah? Never will a Muslim who is in his right mind ever say that Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, another next guy on the block, what's the name? Mbappe? Huh? What's the other one called? That plays with him. Neymar. Neymar. Hmm. Who's better than him? I think why he's the. And this other one, what's the, I think the Swedish one. Swedish? It's Swedish, right? Norwegian. Holland. Huh? Would anybody say that Holland or Mbappe or Ronaldo or Messi is greater than Allah Azza wa Jal? Would anybody here say that? Taib. When you're sitting in front of the TV, fully focused, right? When it comes to the Quran, we can't sit there for five minutes, but 90 minutes we are focused. Add extra time to that, 120 minutes, plus the penalty shootout. Add another 20 minutes to that, 150 minutes. That's two hours and 30 minutes. Your eyes are glued to the TV. 
If somebody walks past you, throw something, get out of the way. And then you hear Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar for Maghrib prayer, for Isha prayer, messages around the corner. What are you saying in essence, brothers and sisters? If you continue whatever you're doing, aren't you saying with your limbs and actions speak louder than words, right? This is even a scholarly statement uttered by scholars of the past. In essence, what you're saying is that these kuffar, these footballers, are greater than Allah because you chose them and you prioritized them. Is that clear, brothers and sisters? Imam Shabir Rahmatullah was saying, If you really want to know your position before Allah, then you should see what triggers you. As soon as you see a sin, there's a way a Muslim should deal with it. Does that even trigger you or do you even care? But then look how focused, look at the, I was going to say khushu' but I'm not going to say that, right? Look at the concentration, the focus you have in front of the TV. Or whatever you're watching. But when it comes to Allah, he has it to say. Shaykh then goes on to say The next trait that Shaykh makes mention of that one should adorn and beautify himself with is to have husn or dhan of Allah Azza wa to have good thoughts of Allah Azza wa You think good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he won't fail in fulfilling that which he has attributed to himself. Imam Shafi rahmatullahi alayhi he was asked كَيْفَ يَكُونُ السُوءُ الظَّنِّ بِاللَّهِ How does one have bad thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, Al waswasatu wal khawfu daim min wuqoo al musiba. To have this continuous doubt and fear that there are calamities going to be taking place. You know how people are just waiting around, sitting around, waiting anxiously. Sah? Oh, this bad thing is going to happen to me and then. You know, I'm going to walk outside and I'll probably, you know, there's no husnudan whatsoever. Right? And it is as if you're waiting for some of your blessings to disappear. One has been blessed with something. Because of his bad thought of Allah Azza wa he thinks that this is going to what? Perish and disappear. Or that something is going to happen to that which you've been blessed with. Are you guys with me? Everybody get that so far? All of this, uh, all of that which was mentioned are types of having bad thoughts of Allah Azza wa Jal. Give you guys a couple of examples. One of my favorite hadiths that I always mention is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّكَ لَن تَدَعَ شَيْئًا إِتِّقَاءً لِلَّهِ إِلَّا عَطَاكَ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا مِنْ Never leave something for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal because of you being fearful of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? Except He will always give you that which is better. Do you guys agree with that? Now you've heard the hadith. You're involved in haram, right? It's time to leave it, right? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promising you? Huh? What is Allah Azza wa Jal promising you? That if you leave this haram, I'm going to give you that which is better, sah? But then you continuously worry that Allah Azza wa is not going to do that. This is a type of sultan. And to add to that, something that Ibn Qayyim mentioned. 
And I'm going to share with you guys a very personal experience. And I told Nabil this not so long ago. There was a period in my life, it was around the COVID period, right? I was trying to balance between work, because we had to come back. I had to leave Medina to come back. And of course, at the time, huh? my dad would always say to me, listen, you got family, a child on the way, right? Don't play around with this job. Take it seriously. You know, parents are always worried, right? They want to see progression. And many parents see as progression, you're going to school, getting an education, finding work, okay, then marrying, having kids, buying a house. This is what is today seen as, and I should put this into what? Quotation marks, progression in life. Do you guys agree with that? Jamil. And he kept on telling me, don't play around with this job. Take it seriously, right? You need the money. And at the time, right? Things were very, very uncertain. I remember the first day when I came back from Medina, my dad sat me down and he said to me, listen, whatever money you have, hold on to it. Looks like these kuffar are gonna eat one another. Right? Look at the way they're behaving in the markets and also in the grocery stores. Running around with, uh, knocking this guy over, taking all the toilet roll, uh, fighting with one another due to the basic essentials that's very, very limited at the moment. He sat me down and he said, listen, whatever money you have, hold on to it. These guys look like they're going to eat one another. Well, I remember I went upstairs, I made dua to Allah Azza wa Jalla, Ya Allah, right? Grant me a job and whatever have you. Alhamdulillah, I got a job two days or three days later, was it? It came along. And at a time when there was no jobs, right? There was no jobs at all because of the situation at the time. A couple of months down the line, I was really struggling. Some of you guys remember, right? Brother was stabbed in the neck. My phone can't stop ringing, or my phone doesn't stop ringing. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to still finish off my uni because the uni was online. 5 a.m. in the morning, you have to be awake. 5 a.m. in the morning because of the time differences. And I'm really struggling here. I'm doing a job at the same time. Work. Long story cut short. And it wasn't an easy decision. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to leave whatever I'm doing. And I'm going to take my talab al ilm a little bit more seriously. Right? I've got uni studies, there's stuff that I want to read, stuff that I want to memorize. Well, like sometimes I would write lines of poetry on a piece of paper and I would put it next to my desk. Because how much it was hurting me not being able to study how I would normally study. And they were very flexible. You could even take a mushaf and start reading it in between calls. And... So I left the job. You know, sometimes you read a book come across benefits, and it might not necessarily always stand out. I opened my phone, and I saw this statement of Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi. You know, remember the hadith that I gave you guys, right? You don't leave something for the sake of Allah, except Allah will give it out, which is better. Look what Ibn al-Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi says. وَمَنْ ظَنَّ بِهِ أَنَّهُ إِذَا تَرَكَ لِأَجْلِهِ شَيْئًا لم يعوده خيرا منه أو من فعل لأجله شيئا لم يعطه أفضل منه فقد ظن به ظن سوء. Which translates to be whoever thinks that if he was to now do something for Allah سبحانه وتعالى سيك and that Allah عز وجل will not give him better or whoever now does something for the sake of Allah عز وجل did I say it correctly? The first part was, right? Whoever thinks that if he was to leave something off for the sake of Allah, which goes in accordance to the hadith that I mentioned, right? And that Allah Azza wa Jal is not going to give him that which is better. Or, he then says, whoever now does something. We're not speaking about leaving something haram. 
doing now something for the sake of Allah. And that if he was to do that, Allah will not give him that which is better. Indeed, he has had bad thoughts of Allah Azza wa Allah that brought me to tears. It's like a message that Allah Azza wa sent me. It wasn't easy. Right? All of these things are happening. There's a little one on the way. And then you want to leave your job because it's affecting your talab al-ilm. Because you need time. And then I see this message. I saw it as a sign. Lie. And the rest is history, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened certain doors. Right? And things were better than what it was before. So some of you brothers, I remember having this conversation with some of the brothers here. You may want to maybe reduce your hours because you want to spend more time seeking knowledge. If your intentions are sincere, then expect good. And I don't think that Allah Azza wa Jalla is not going to give you that which is better. Here he's saying, you thinking that Allah is not going to give you better, then indeed you have had bad thoughts of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Right? Husnu dhanni billahi Azza wa Jalla. One of my favorite sayings is a saying of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ He swears by Allah, by the one whom my soul is in his hand. لَا يُحْسِنُ عَبْدٌ أَظَّنَّ بِاللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ إِلَّا عَطَاهُ إِيَّهِ Never does an individual have good thoughts of Allah عز و جل except he will give him that which is better. Except Allah عز و جل will give him that which he had good thoughts of Allah عز و جل for. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ الْخَيْرَ بِيَدِهِ And that is because the good is in the hands of Allah عز و جل. Abdullah ibn Sa'ud. Is that clear, brothers and sisters? Right? It's only a little tweak. Right? Seeing that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Not always being negative that only bad things are going to happen. But inshallah, khair. Right? Things will take a turn for the better. That's positivity, right? Even when you speak to psychologists, they tell you to get rid of this negative mentality that you might have. And that actually really does stress you out and make you feel depressed when you have a negative what? Mindset. Doesn't put you in a good place. That's why so many of these kuffar, they committed suicide in the COVID period. How many times did I read a news article of someone committed suicide? Why? They felt like there was no light at the end of the tunnel. They felt miserable being stuck at home. Can you see the immediate benefits that you could take away with Hasan al even in times like that? In this world here, while the Muslims are saying, inshallah, things will get better. There's light at the end of the tunnel that keeps your morale up. However, the kafir doesn't have these nusus. He's living in darkness, right? If you're someone who's extremely outgoing as a kafir, and now you've been stuck in the house and Boris Johnson, right, keeps muddling up his words. One moment everyone thinks they're coming out of the lockdown and then next moment you're back in. You just become more miserable, more miserable. And that happens once, it happens twice, and then thrice. And Iman, Islam, brothers, sisters. You study, it just changes you as a person with the way you think. These psychologists may think that they are the part, right? Nobody can tell you like the one who is most knowing, right? And whose speciality it is. That's none than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Who created a psychologist and gave him ilm. Right? مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا As Allah says, you haven't been given them knowledge except that which is little. Also, Ibn Al-Tayn Rahmatullahi Alayhi mentions pertaining to what we just said. وَمَنْ ظَنَّ بِهِ أَنَّهُ يَنَالُ 
ما عنده بمعصيته ومخالفته كما يناله بطاعته والتقرب إليه فقد ظن به خلاف حكمته وخلاف موجب أسمائه وصفاته وهو من ظن السوء. Whoever thinks that he will attain the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing sins. You know, some people like that, right? The people who say, Al Iman is in my heart. My heart is good, and the guy is engaging in filth. And he thinks him continuing these sins is actually going to get him to a Jannah. That Allah Azza wa is Ghafoor Rahim, He's going to forgive me, and not a big deal. Do we not hear these kind of things? You advise somebody and he says to you, Akhi, my iman is in my heart, I have a good heart, don't judge me. Sah? Don't judge me. You don't know what's in my heart. You know what Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi mentions? فَقَلَّ مَنْ تَجِدُ فِي اعْتِقَادِهِ فَسَادًا إِلَّا وَهُوْ يُظْهِرُ ذَلِكَ فِي عَمَلِهِ You will barely find someone with a corrupt belief except that this will now begin to show on his limbs. Isn't this what we take away from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said أَلَا وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَةً إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلَّ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَتْ Prophet, my, my, my mother, yeah? One second. Yes, mama. Huh? 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 Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go at the Bahia. Bahia, the Kuwait, there's a house or a Kabahi. Less than all. Okay, hey. Okay, inshallah. Hey. Thanks, sir. Sorry, Prophet. Yeah. There was just a bit of a situation that happened, and my mom was very, very worried. So, on every hand, doesn't this now fall in line with what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi said when he told us, "Indeed, there is what inside of your body a what a mudra, a piece of flesh. If that becomes corrupt, everything else becomes corrupt. If that becomes rectified, everything else becomes rectified. What is that? It's the heart. When it becomes corrupt, it begins to show and profess on your limbs." Begins to show and profess on your limbs. And even Umar Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said we were commanded and instructed to what? To judge what is apparent. I don't know what's in your heart. However, this wrong thing that you're doing, I have to do something about it. And sometimes they might say, mind your own business, sah? And they'll even go as far as quoting a hadith in the fourth hadith Imam Nawi. Who can tell me the hadith? Part of one being a good Muslim is to leave of that which doesn't concern him. It's got evidence now. Part of one being a good Muslim is to leave of that which doesn't concern him. Mind your own business, don't judge me, you don't know what's in my heart. Wallahi, that's a misapplication of the hadith. Because you have so many other hadith that you need to reconcile. Like when the Messenger said, whoever sees an evil, what should you do? Change it with your hand. You can't change it with your hand, you change with? Change with your tongue. You can't change it with your tongue, you? Change, you hate it with your heart. And that's the weakest part of an iman. So I've been instructed to do something about this. That hadith you quoted has an application and a context. When you're now speaking about somebody's private life and what happened between him and his wife and isn't that the time when you really should be minding your own business? Huh? But the conversation becomes ma'an, right? As they say in Somali. Very juicy when someone else is being spoken about. Huh? It's very juicy, interesting, intriguing. That council call, everyone comes out on Twitter, makes it their business. Oh, wow, retweet, send it to this guy. Now you should be minding your own business. Unless, of course, you're a person of authority who's trying to do something about it. Or trying to change an evil which is going to affect the masses. In that time, you, might have to, you, may, you may have to discuss a particular personality or a name. So 
So he's basically saying here, whoever thinks that he will now attain a Jannah or the reward, right? The promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing sins, just as he would if he were to now engage in acts of worship. This person has indeed had bad thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a form of su'adhani billahi I think this is also worth mentioning, right? It's the last thing that I mentioned. And I've had people come up to me, right? Say, okay, your advice is now that Allah has ordered is going to give me that which is better. However, I didn't actually get a better job. Allah, the majority, if not all of those who I gave this hadith to, right? They came up to me saying that Allah has already gave them that which is better. Some would come and just kiss me on the forehead and say, Zakallah khair. And yes, you will go through some troubles and some trials. Right? I can say it till tomorrow, maybe give you guys incidents and stories after stories of people who left a haram job, then Allah has already gave them better. However, when the Messenger said, He will give you that which is better, right? It comes in its different forms and types and manifestations. This is why Ibn Al-Qayyim Rahmatullahi Alayhi says وَالْعِوَضُ أَنْوَاعٌ مُخْتَلِفَةٌ Comes in his different forms and types. وَأَجَلُّ مَا يُعَوَّضُ بِهِ الْأُنْسُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَحَبَّتِهِ وَطُمَأْنِينَةِ الْقَلْبِ بِهِ وَقُوَّتِهِ وَنَشَاطِهِ وَفَرْحِ وَرِضَاهُ عَنْ رَبِّهِ تَعَالَى Right? And the greatest of that which Allah Azza wa Jal can grant you from the things that are better than that which you left off Right? Al-unsu billah. To experience that pleasure in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That peace, that pleasure that you feel in your heart that Allah Azza wa Jal places inside of that piece of flesh that money can't buy. And even it's so hard to describe. Right? That's something my brothers and sisters that money can't buy. Right? That so many of the kuffar today are crying out for. That's why they turn to so many distractions. Jazakumullah khairan wa ahsan